distinct pleasure to introduce the very first Botanical Society of America Emerging Leader Award winner, Stacy Smith. And so I want to give you just a little bit of background on this award. Um, the uh, BSA board realized that we were, at least we thought we were doing a pretty good job at recognizing our more senior members with merit awards and so forth and recognizing our graduate students with travel awards and research awards and best paper awards and so forth. But there was a pretty significant career gap in between that we weren't doing a very good job of expressing how much we appreciate and um, need the accomplishments. Larry, is that because you can't hear me? Oh. <laughs> is, can everybody hear me? Okay, so, um, so we, we, we were looking for a way to really um, uh, honor our more junior members of the society and express our appreciation for the incredible things that they do. So in 2013, we created the Emerging, Emerging Leader Award to recognize the outstanding accomplishments and potential for future leadership in botany of our junior members. And the first inaugural award was made last summer in 2014 to Stacy Smith. And I just think that this is, Stacy is the most perfect um, awardee to, because she really, really exemplifies all of the creativity, research accomplishments, outreach, and, and leadership, scholarship, I could go on and on and on, that we treasure in all of our young members. So a really terrific choice for this first award. Um, so just a little bit about Stacy. She received her PhD at the University of Wisconsin working with David Baum and then went to Duke University where she worked as a postdoc with Mark Rauscher and she's now an assistant professor at the University of Colorado. Lucky them. Um, and I could go through her CV and list um, all of her publications, books, grants, and so forth, but I think um, actually a better way to convey to you some of Stacy's qualities is to read the final paragraph of David Baum's uh, nomination letter. He says, Stacy has all the attributes that characterize a world-class scientist, enviable organizational and management skills, broad understanding in a diversity of fields, uh, secondary metabolism, plant development, statistical phylogenetics, evolutionary theory, plant ecology, genetics, and genomics, um, a bottomless pit of curiosity, rigid self-discipline, superb oral and written communication skills, and a deep creative spark. She has a very bright future ahead of her. Furthermore, she is a generous and supportive person who leads by example and draws along many other junior and senior, including me, I've learned so much from Stacy, colleagues in her wake. As a result, Stacy is richly deserving of the 2014 BSA Emerging Leader Award. So um, please join me in recognizing Stacy Smith, who will talk about mechanisms of flower color convergence above and below the species level. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you, Pam. I have to say, it's, it's almost hard to start a talk after such a nice introduction. I'm all, I'm all verklempt, um, but, I'll, but I'll hold it together. Um, thank you guys so much for creating this award and this program. I think it was really visionary to, to, to recognize that there was a need to support um, uh, uh, beginning faculty at this stage of our careers, and I'm really honored to have been the first person to get this award. And it's great to have the chance to tell you about the work that I've done. And so today I'm going to be focusing on the genetic aspects of my work, and in particular um, looking at how uh, convergent flower color evolution happens. So I'd like to start out sort of broadly talking about phenotypic convergence. I think that's something that um, fascinates us all, um, especially systematists among us, partially because um, convergent patterns are often the ones that confound us in a taxonomic sense. And there's also that wonder about how things that are not closely related come to look so darn similar. Um, so, but beyond this um, sort of wonder about convergent evolution, I think the other reason that it fascinates us evolutionarily is that it suggests that when exposed to similar environmental or selective pressures, different lineages will evolve morphologically with the same kinds of responses, that they'll produce similar adaptations at a phenotypic level. And so, put another way, these convergent patterns of evolution, like I'm showing here with the, the succulents um, and the, um, the floral um, traits, these suggest that to some degree, morphology and its evolution is predictable. So 
what has been sort of a, a surprising and fascinating theme to start to emerge from evolutionary and developmental studies in the last 20 or so years is that not only can evolution be predictable in terms of morphology, but it's often predictable at the molecular level. And so I'm showing here a couple of um, classic examples. Uh-oh. Oh, now I'm in trouble. If anybody has a... Oh, Oh, there, it's working great. Um, so I'm showing this, uh, this PIDX1 example where the same gene has been co-opted for pelvic reduction and things that are very distantly related, like sticklebacks and manatees. Um, so that was a big surprise. Um, here's another case where uh, many different orders of insects have evolved um, not just, not just use the same gene to deal with plant toxins, but have um, undergone the same amino acid substitutions um, in the same gene in response to um, dealing with plant toxins. And it's this ATPase gene, and, and here you can see in gray some of these um, convergent substitutions in this locus. So really surprising amount of um, convergent molecular evolution associated with the convergent phenotypic evolution. So, one reason that, that um, has been put forward to suggest why this might happen, why lineages might make the same derived phenotype with the same um, molecular changes, has been relatedness. Well, maybe they're using the same genes and genetic changes because they're coming from the same um, or similar starting genetic background. And this does seem to hold for some examples. So um, this cavefish example, where there have been um, independent populations that have gone into the caves and become albinos um, from an ancestral um, above ground population, and all of that has involved changes, um, all the albinism has involved changes in this OCA2 gene. But that is not always the case. Sometimes things that are closely related make the same phenotype in different ways. And so um, one example here shown is um, Drosophila melanogaster, which has evolved these similar pigmentation patterns um, in the old world and the new world, but using different genes, even though it's the same species. So it's clear that relatedness is not a perfect explanation. So another explanation that we might think about is, well, maybe the same gene gets used over and over again because this is just the gene. This is just the only way to do this. And certainly in this example I mentioned previously, this um, sodium-potassium pump that, um, that interacts with uh, cardinalides um, in these insects, this is the gene that is interacting directly with, this, with these compounds, so it's not surprising that convergent evolution of resistance to these compounds has evolved through changes in that same gene. Um, and it's not even surprising that the same amino acids have changed because those amino acids are clustered. Okay, if somebody does have a better pointer, I'll definitely borrow it. Um, those amino acids are clustered around the section of the gene that interacts. Um, interacts. Oh, really? Sweet. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, anyway, the, the amino acids that interact um, with that compound are the ones that have undergone these convergent substitutions. Okay, but so maybe, maybe that's not always the case, and sometimes there are convergent phenotypes that can arise by changes in many different loci. And so a classic example um, is coat color in mice, where here's your wild-type mouse, and you can make a light-colored mouse by changing lots of different genes. Um, and some of these genes are, are shown here in this pathway. However, when we look at in nature, it's um, the same two genes that commonly give rise to pigmentation differences um, that we see for example, between species or between populations. So the suggestion has been that even though many genes can do it, some genes are the better way to do it. Um, that they're ones that sit in a position in the pathway that when mutated results in fewer pleiotropic consequences. And um, you can see, for example, this gene, when you mutate it, you get a really weird looking mouse. So that would be a bad way to make a light colored mouse. Um, so, um, some evolutionary biologists have, have considered how this would sort of play forward over time. How would, this, how would this work within a lineage? So we can imagine sort of an array of substitutions that vary in how pleiotropic they are, with some of them having pretty bad consequences if you mutate them, and other ones having fewer, being called um, minimally pleiotropic. And what they envision is that these different mutations are popping up in the populations, but over time, selection is filtering the mutations, so only the ones that have low pleiotropy are likely to become fixed. And um, Gomplin and Prudhomme called this selection funneling. So um, 
I think in trees and I'm interested in trees, so I want to think about how would this play forward over longer evolutionary time scales? Um, how, could, how would this work on a phylogenetic scale? So um, here I've envisioned sort of a simple four species phylogeny, in which case, in which we have these white mutants that pop up. Here's a white mutant popping up here. Here's a white mutant popping up in this bee species. And sometimes these white mutants go to fixation, as they have here in A and C. And so if this selection funneling is happening um, in this process, what I predict is that only a subset of mutations are going to get fixed in A and C. And to put this another way, I think that A and C, if we look at how they've made white flowers, they will have done it with more similar mutations. That is, there'll be higher molecular convergence at these, um, in these mutations that are involved in species level differences than when we look at populations that show segregating polymorphism. So I'm predicting that even though there are lots of ways to make a white phenotype, that only certain ones are getting fixed at the species level, leading to this higher molecular convergence um, at macroevolutionary timescales. Okay, so um, what do we know about this already? So um, there was this pretty exciting, I mean to me, pretty exciting paper um, that came, um, uh, came out a few years ago. Uh, actually, there's a pair of papers where they looked at basically all of the data sets where people have found the mutations underlying phenotypic differences. Um, and they asked this question about, is there a difference in the mutations that are involved in species differences versus within species differences? And they observed that more cis-regulatory mutations um, are fixed to give rise to species differences than below the species level. So there's an indication across many studies that um, regulatory variation has been important in species differences. However, a challenge with asking this molecular convergence question that I'm interested in at this sort of scale is that this involves many traits. And so we can't ask, well, is it the same loci? Is it the same changes at those loci? So I would argue that in order to really understand and address this question, we need to look at a single trait and how it evolves repeatedly um, across the phylogeny. And so I think flower color is really the ideal trait to do that because we see exactly this pattern that I demonstrated in my hypothetical example. If you look within species, you often see um, segregating flower color polymorphisms. And then we often see also species that are fixed for new flower colors. In fact, it flip-flops back and forth more than about any other trait on the phylogeny. It's, it's very labile. And so the, the group that I have studied flower color in for a very long time, it's getting close to 15 years now. Oh, so I don't feel so emerging in that context. Um, <laughs> But, but anyway, uh, <laughs> so here's, here's Iochroma and its relatives. So Iochroma is this, this genus that's known for big tubular flowers. This is a group in the tomato family. Um, there are a bunch of other smaller genera that it's closely related to. Basically, none of them are monophyletic, so there's actually a lot of work to do here still on the taxonomic end of things. Um, but what's been great about this group is that it's very, um, it's highly variable in terms of flower color. And for asking this specific question, um, convergent evolution of um, of white flowers, it's happened a bunch of times. So flower pigments have been lost in this, in this group several times, sometimes recently here, and sometimes farther back in time. And we also have a number of species that have these segregating morphs, and I've blown up a few of those segregating morphs here to show you how, how they have this sharp contrast between the pigmented and unpigmented form. So a great study system for this. So. Um, the kinds of pigments that, that I'll be talking about, which we've had some great talks on anthocyanin pigments um, at this meeting, um, and I hope to talk more with people about that later on. Um, so this group of pigments, um, all of you are familiar with them. These uh, red, purple, and blue pigments, these are the things that make blueberries blue and strawberries red. So they're the most common pigments in, in plants. They're water soluble, and so um, if you look inside of a plant cell, you'll see these um, Tissues that are colored have their vacuoles filled with these pigments. Um, and the pathway is very well known. We started working on uh, putting, we, not me, but uh, biochemists put this pathway together um, starting about 20 years ago. And so it's, it's exceptionally well known. It's deeply conserved across angiosperms. And basically it takes some uncolored compounds and through a series of enzymatic steps, these things in the circles, converts uncolored things into these colored pigments. 
Um, I've also noted here on the side um, the, the transcription factors that activate this pathway. So the regulation of this pathway is also pretty well known. And in Iachroma and in um, quite a few other species, it's broken into two regulatory blocks with these upstream genes um, regulated by um, some R2R3 MIB transcription factors and the downstream genes by some other members of that same MIB uh, family as well as BHLH and WD40 genes. So, um, what I'll be looking at in this talk um, is the contribution of coding sequence mutations and regulatory mutations to flower color variation within and above the species level. And so I want to know, can you make a new flower color by breaking these genes in natural populations? Do those mutations ever get fixed? Um, and then to what degree um, are expression changes involved in flower color um, shifts? And so this will all be with the aim of addressing that question about the, the, the level of convergence um, at different time scales. So before I go into this question, I need to tell you a little bit more about this pathway and its importance in plant physiology. So um, the pathway that produces pigments um, also shares steps with some other flavonoid compounds. So this is a large pathway, this flavonoid pathway. The anthocyanin piece is a small part of it. Other things that come off this pathway in Solanaceae are flavones and flavanols. Um, all of these compounds, all of these flavonoid compounds are potent antioxidants, which is why you can buy some of these things as nutraceuticals, um, but they serve the same purpose in plants. They're strong antioxidants that are involved in stress responses. They get turned on during drought, heat stress, UV radiation. Um, and then within these, uh, these categories, in addition to being antioxidants, they're also involved in things like signaling and, um, and defense. So, so given all the roles that these compounds play in plant physiology, in addition to making things colorful, um, we would predict that breaking this pathway, that is making a white flower by having a, a coding mutation that knocks out function of these enzymes, would probably have negative pleiotropic consequences. That is, coding mutations in any of these enzymes, um, we presume, would be in that uh, worst category, the ones less likely to turn into species differences. And so um, we have set out to test this hypothesis that inactivating mutations, loss of function mutations, frame shift mutations, that could give you a derived white flower state um, might happen within species, but that we're not going to see them fixed at the species level. And so um, we haven't completely answered this question, but I'm going to show you the data we have so far. So um, I'm going to start off by talking about one particular case, um, which uh, a great undergraduate student of mine, Rachel Coburn, worked on when I was at Nebraska. And it's this polymorphism in Iachroma calicinum, which is native to northern Ecuador. And the plant is commonly known as la, la teta de vaca, which um, means, uh, I see some laughing, good, uh, which means the cow's teat plant because um, back in like the 1800s, a German botanist described how there's these mutilage, uh, mucilage producing cells inside, so, the, so the, the bud is protected inside of this fleshy calyx with tons of mucilage. And the, the flowers actually come out kind of sticky, like just born sticky. So it's really a lovely plant um, and it has this this, uh, oh, so the teta de vaca is because then kids can pick up the bud and squeeze it and shoot the mucilage at their friends. So, so that's why cows teat plant, because you can squeeze it and stuff comes out. So, so anyway, um, this plant has a rare white morph that I observed once in an herbarium specimen and I found once in nature. Unfortunately, this one plant is now gone because the tiny village of Chiriboga has um, somehow undergone a population boom and decided they needed electricity, so now there's a light post right where that plant was. Um, so maybe there's another plant out there. I don't know. I'm really sorry to have lost this one, but we, we found it once and collected it and, and we studied it very intensively, this one sample. Um, and here's what we found. So Rachel sequenced all the genes um, in this entire, in the entire pathway from these two morphs, and she found uh, one um, loss of function, putative loss of function mutation, a big deletion in one gene in this pathway, the DFR gene. And so I'm showing here the alleles from the blue morph and the white morph, and here's this deletion. And I've shown above here on the blue morph the sites in this protein that have been implicated in doing its job, in binding the substrate and turning it into the precursors of anthocyanins. Um, yeah, so I've highlighted here DFR in the pathway. You can see that DFR does this job of pulling these three precursors, 
um, down and turning them into pigments. So um, it's sort of the gateway between making flavanols and anthocyanins. So it's a pretty key gene. So um, like I said, uh, we know uh, that these sites that got deleted are probably important for its function. We have a crystal structure for this from Vitus because people in working in grape care a lot about pigmentation. And so they're like, oh, we need a crystal structure for this. So we can thank the grape people for that. And, um, and, and make these hypotheses about the function of these sites. So uh, we wanted to go a little further and see, okay, well, does this actually um, cause this gene to stop working? Uh, Rachel and I cloned uh, DFR from these, um, these two morphs, and we expressed them in vitro and mixed them with the pigment precursors that DFR works on. And the pattern's pretty striking. I could show you the quantitative data, but I think visually it's pretty apparent that the DFR from the white morph does not work at all, totally lost function. So nothing, that enzyme is, is knocked out. Um, meanwhile, the blue morph uh, copy of this gene works great. And interestingly, it works best on DHM, which is the precursor of blue pigments. So, so this, these patterns uh, really support the fact that, that this DFR mutation is functional and is the cause of that, um, that white flower morph. So, there's still, okay, so that was one case, and there's lots of these to do, and what's been really exciting about this project is that um, the more time we spend in the field, the more crazy flower color mutants we find, and I'm just showing a very small sample of them here, and um, I've come to think that if I could look hard enough, eventually I would find a non-anthocyanin producing morph of basically every species. I think, I think hidden out there somewhere waiting for me is some white or yellow morph of every species, and um, they just happen to be rare. So there's that one Kellycinum. There's, there's one individual of Parvifolium. Um, here's this really cool um, Sriracha punctata one that I found that's not so rare. There's actually a population of it. So there's a lot of work to be done. We've also found new species in the process. So this is a new species that is polymorphic. So this data set keeps growing, and at some point I'm going to have to stop growing it and actually finish the data collection on it. But so um, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the rest of these morphs. So let's turn now to the species level. So I told you there have been a bunch of fixed transitions where lineages have lost anthocyanin pigmentation. And I'm showing representatives of them here. Like I said, some are recent and some have lost anthocyanin pigmentation a long time ago. So we can ask, do these lineages show any inactivating mutations? Is the pathway still in them? Or is the pathway degrading over time after the loss of anthocyanin pigmentation? So uh, my postdoc, my previous postdoc, uh, Winnie Ho, she looked at this. Um, she sequenced an upstream, sort of a middle stream and a downstream pathway gene for the vast majority of species, including about half white and half pigmented species, um, to look and see, are there any obvious loss of function mutations like the one that we saw in DFR? And the short answer is she found none. And if you go and look at the... Um, the signatures of molecular evolution in these genes, you also find that in the white lineages, as in the pigmented lineages, all of these genes are under purifying selection. So they have DNDS in the range of sort of 0.2 to 0.4. So that is to say that selection appears to be acting to maintain their function. They're not undergoing positive selection, and they don't appear to be evolving neutrally. Um, although I will note that um, the, the DNDS is a little bit higher in the white lineages, so, so it appears that maybe selection is a little relaxed on those genes, but certainly they don't seem to be um, degrading. Now, another way to see if those genes are still working is to see if um, they're still making the products of that pathway. Um, so even though the white flowered lineages are not making pigments anymore, they could still make upstream uh, products. And so uh, my postdoc, my current postdoc, Andrea Berardi, has been looking at that. We're using HPLC to profile the pigments. So here you can see um, a purple species making those blue delphinidin pigments and making a little bit of flavanols and acnistus arborescens, which, by the way, um, uh, is the only scented thing, this is just for Rob, is the only clade of scented things, and apparently it has limonene, I, I remember that. Um, so anyway, uh, it's the only scented thing in the group, and it is also making tons of flavanol. So, so this species looks like uh, those upstream steps of the pathway are working. Um, and if we look at a few more, and again, we don't have data for many of these, it seems like those white lineages, even though they're not making floral pigments, they're still, um, they're still making upstream parts of those pathways. So the two first genes that I showed you that are under purifying selection, not only are they under purifying selection, but they're working and producing flavanols and flowers. So collectively, these data support that hypothesis that 
Bad mutations can happen that break these genes. Loss of function mutations can evolve, um, but they don't seem to be fixed at the species level. Whenever we look at white species that are fixed for losses of pigmentation, they still have the whole pathway. Um, I want to mention that, uh, so we've, we showed this one case um, in Iachroma. There are actually only two other known cases. I think we have this sense that flower color is so well studied. We know so much about flower color. N not really. So only after all these years of study have we ever found three coding sequence mutations in nature, two of them in DFR, one of them in CHS. So we're, we're still a long way from definitively answering this question. So um, I want to turn now to talking about expression differences. So in the same way that um, mutations in this pathway which break the function of any of these genes could knock out um, anthocyanin pigments, uh, any mutation that would turn down the expression of these genes could also reduce anthocyanin pigmentation. Um, and in the same way that, that I discussed with the, the coding sequence mutation, if we were to turn down these upstream genes, we would also probably affect these other important compounds, the flavanols and the flavones. So, so we predict, um, in terms of pleiotropic effects, that expression differences, if they're to be involved in flower color evolution at the species level, are likely to target these downstream genes that just affect anthocyanin pigments and don't affect um, the upstream parts of this pathway. So I also want to remind you that these things could happen in two different ways. These, um, these expression differences could happen through cis-regulatory mutations. So for example, we could have a change in the DFR promoter that prevents the, the transcription factor complex from binding. That would cause a loss of expression. Alternately, we could have trans-regulatory mutations, something happening to the transcription factor that causes it not to activate DFR. So um, both of these are ways to turn off genes. However, um, transregulatory mutations have a specific prediction, which is that because these genes are regulated in blocks, um, if we affect these transcription factor genes, we're going to turn off multiple pathway genes, not just one. So cis-regulatory mutations would affect one gene by itself. A transregulatory mutation would affect the expression of multiple genes. So, so our hypothesis here, given the structure of the pathway, is that um, when we see fixed losses of floral pigmentation, they're likely to be due to these expression changes, not coding sequence mutations, expression changes, um, and they're likely to target those downstream steps of the pathway. And because I've already shown you that coding sequence mutations can give rise to within species differences, we may not see any coding, uh, any expression differences at all when we look at flower color morphs within species. So we have begun to look at these, um, these patterns of differential expression across the pathway and across species, and I'm just showing you um, a few uh, species pairs here. So here I've got two blue species, Iochromocyneum and uh, Sriracha catensis, and uh, two species that lack anthocyanin pigmentation. So as you would expect, the anthocyanin-producing genes have the whole pathway on. So both of these blue species have expression of all of the genes in the pathway. And then if we look at these two independent losses of anthocyanin pigmentation, we note that they're still, um, they're still expressing those upstream genes, which is consistent with that observation that they're still making upstream compounds. Um, meanwhile, the downstream anthocyanin-specific steps are strongly downregulated. So um, specifically, the genes that are turned down are the ones that make precursors of blue, uh, blue pigments, this F3'5 from H gene, and these two, uh, these two downstream genes, DFR and ANS. So as I mentioned, this could be due to cis-regulatory mutations. Maybe each one of these genes has had a mutation that independently caused its loss of expression. However, a more parsimonious explanation would be that there's been some change in a transacting factor that has caused them to jointly have the loss of expression. So um, I'd like to now look for a second at um, the variation within species. Okay, so I've shown you that uh, at this macroevolutionary level, we see a repeated loss of downstream gene expression. What do we see within species? So uh, here are two species that have uh, polymorphisms. And it's the same setup here. So here's the, the blue morph of that species. It's, it's expressing all of the genes. 
And in this case, the white morph, its pattern mimics almost exactly what we observe for the species level transitions, to the point where I was actually worried that I mixed up the example, the, like, I, like I messed up the photos. It looked so close to Denalia solanacea, but if you look close, you'll see the bands are a little bit different, like I, I definitely didn't make this up. It's just striking how similar those expression patterns are. Meanwhile, when we look at the polymorphism in Iochroma calicinum, the one where I showed you that, that DFR mutations evolved, there's no expression difference between those morphs. So that, um, that white morph of calicinum it still has um, all the transacting factors working and all of those anthocyanin genes being turned on. It's just that they're not making pigment because DFR is broken. So um, this is consistent with what I showed you previously. Okay, so, so overall then, even though we don't have that much data, it's certainly consistent with this hypothesis that uh, the way to evolve, sort of the preferred evolutionary pathway to make a white flower um, is to turn down the downstream anthocyanin in specific parts of the pathway. And um, this has been observed in other systems, not just ours. Um, Petunia is probably one of the best studied systems. And um, in Petunia and in Antirhinum specifically, people have gone further to identify not just which genes are turned down, but which specific um, mutations have caused that. And pretty strikingly, um, it's always these R2, R3 transcription factors. So these genes seem to be um, the stuff of um, changes in pigmentation, the stuff of evolution when it comes to changes in pigmentation. So, why are two R threes, right? It could have been uh, any one of these transcription factors that could have turned down all of these guys. So why are two R threes? It's been related to um, their specialization. So the way these transcription factor complexes work is that you have some pretty generic WD40 and BHLH genes that are low copy number in the genome. They combine with one of a very diverse set of R2, R3 MIBs, and that that R3 or R2 MIB gives the specificity of that complex to say which specific targets to bind to. So it's sort of the key that unlocks where this, this transcription factor complex should be targeted. So you see some examples here. Um, you know, there's specialized MIBs just for turning on trichomes, some just for. Um, doing uh, hypocotyl cells, pigment, um, seed coat pigmentation. So, so MIBs are very specialized. In fact, um, uh, we just did a survey in the lab of uh, how many MIBs there are in various solanaceae. It's, um, you know, close to 200 of just the R2, R3 MIBs, just a subset of this family. So it's gigantic. Uh, and so that allows for very um, high specificity of these copies that can just do one little job in one little tissue. So given this background that like everybody else found it was the R2, R3 MIBs. Obviously, we couldn't help but try and figure out, is that what's going on in our system? So we zoomed in on this one um, species pair here, Iochroma loxensi and Iochroma cyneum, closely related sister species. One reason I chose them is that they're um, pretty recently diverged, so I'm hoping like not too much else has happened. Um, and I'll be able to pin down um, the specific mutation. And um, also that they're, they're quite easily crossable, although Side note, Iochroma, many of them are crossable even across generic boundaries, so that's not necessarily a limitation in this group. So I began by doing pretty classical um, genetic studies, basically crossing these two species and seeing what the progeny looked like. So, um, so here's my two parents. I crossed them, and the F1 to me was already surprising. The F1 is this weird, um, mostly uh, white flower with sort of splotches of pigment on the inside of each of the corolla lobes. So I expected this flower to be a lot closer to this parent, sort of Mendelian style. I expected that if it was a loss of function mutation, um, then this white allele should be recessive, and the dominant pigment phenotype should show up. Um, that's not the case. So that suggests that maybe this was going to be um, a somewhat complicated case. Well, actually not so bad compared to other cases. All right, so, um, so I proceeded to do back crosses here. So I back crossed each of the parents. Um, the first thing I want to note is that in these back crosses, I retrieved the parental phenotype. So we got some individuals that look just like Iochroma cyneum. The same is true in Loxensi back cross. Uh, the other thing that was um, uh, promising about this is that these two morphs uh, in each of the, um, these two phenotypes in each of the back crosses were present in about one-to-one -one ratios. So this is consistent with there being a single gene that is segregating in these back crosses and causing this difference. Okay, so what, what is this gene? 
So I decided to go with a transcriptomic approach, which might seem like overkill for a pathway that's so well known, but I'm also exceptionally frightened of MIBs. There are 300 of them, and I could be making PCR primers to test candidate MIBs for the rest of my life. So, um, so we took a, a candidate, I'm sorry, a transcriptomic approach to figuring out what the causative gene was. Um, and so my, my PhD student, Dan, has helped with this, um, and we also have a, a collaborator at K-State. So basically, the idea was to, um, to pool these things, these um, the parentals and then our back crosses by phenotype, and look to see what genes they have in common. And specifically, to look for genes that show a particular pattern. Okay, so um, we're looking for a gene that obviously has some fixed difference between the two parents, so a blue and a white allele, um, that... Um, in the blue individuals from the back cross has two blue parent alleles, so it's homozygous. The same for the white, and then for the F1 is heterozygous. So we're looking for that kind of pattern. And we only found one gene with that pattern, which, um, So there's just one gene here that showed um, all of the blue individuals have the same uh, genotype here. They all have two, um, ooh, that's loud. Um, two iachromocyneum alleles at this locus. We have an F1 population that's, that's mixed, heterozygous. And then here are the white individuals that have the white allele at this locus. So one thing you may notice, it's not a typo. This does say R3 at the top, not R2, R3. So now I have to spend a second to tell you about R3s. So we didn't know anything about R3s until about five years ago. We started discovering sort of this evil cousin of the R2 R3s that while the R2 R3s are the positive regulators of anthocyanin biosynthesis, the R3s are negative regulators. So they suppress the pathway. And they've only been described from a few species. You can see mostly Arabidopsis, right? So here's all these Arabidopsis copies. And actually, they work mostly on trichomes in Arabidopsis. Um, but in uh, Mimulus petunia, and in Iachroma, we found copies that act on anthocyanins. Um, and so basically, they downregulate the anthocyanin um, specific steps of the pathway much in the way R2, R3s do, but via a different mechanism. So I'm going to spend a second to tell you about this mechanism because I also kind of like molecular natural history, like the story of how genes have new jobs and their, their, um, their roles inside the cell. So I think it's, it's really fascinating what this gene does. So, so I've told you that there's this complex of three transcription factors that stick together and turn on anthocyanin biosynthesis. So they bind to the promoters of these pictures pigmentation genes and they turn them on and you get pigmented tissue. So when the R3 is expressed, the R3 is just the back half of an R2 R3 and it's the half that binds BHLH. So it still has the BHLH binding job and it does that very well. But it doesn't have the front half, the R2 half, that says where to go. So this gene is just gobbling up the BHLH and not taking it anywhere. So, so basically, it is a passive um, repressor. It's just interrupting this, this pathway and sort of leaving the R2, R3, and the WD40 high and dry. So what's cool about having done this with a transcriptomic approach is that now we can go back and ask, well, so are the expression patterns in these pools consistent with this hypothesis? So um, specifically, if the R3 is acting as this passive repressor, we shouldn't see any change in expression in these other transcription factors between any of the pools, right? Nothing's happened to those guys. They're still on. They're just not doing the job anymore because the R3 is, is eating up the BHLH. Um, but what we should see uh, is that all of the anthocyanin genes, or at least the, the, the ones specific to anthocyanin production, at least some of them should be downregulated. So um, what I'm showing here are these three phenotypic pools. And just to remind you, they're, they're the pools that apparently are fixed for having two blue copies of the R3 or two white copies or heterozygous. And what we see is that, indeed, there are anthocyanin genes that are collectively downregulated in, um, in the white pool relative to the purple pool. Meanwhile, those transcription factors that normally do the job Nothing's happened. They're just the same across all those pools. So, so this, this is consistent with that hypothesis. What else is kind of interesting is that if this change at the R3 that's happened in the white species has happened by its expression going up, then we would expect to see that white individuals have more of this R3 um, protein being expressed or transcript being expressed than blue pools. And even though it's a, it's a slight pattern, that is what you see. 
there's less R3 expression in blue individuals and more of it in white individuals. So my, my imaginary scenario is that um, after the split of iochromaloxensi and cyneum, there were some mutations in the cis regulatory region of this R3 that was already around that allowed it to increase in expression and turn down the anthocyanin expression in the flowers. So um, this actually is recently found in another system so, which is pretty, it was pretty exciting, um, given that we didn't know anything about this gene, and now um, another group has found it um, involved in a pair that I'm sure you know about, the, the Mimulus lewisii and Cardinalis species pair that's been classically used for looking at pollinator-mediated selection and speciation. Um, and in this case, uh, lewisii is the low anthocyanin form, and the derived situation is Cardinalis. Now, Cardinalis has a lot more anthocyanin pigmentation, so it's still a regulatory change at that R3 MIB, but it goes the other way. So that R3 is turned down in the flowers of Mimulus Cardinalis, allowing more pigmentation to be expressed. So in Iochroma, like I say, it's the flip situation. We started out with an with a, um, ancestral state of blue, and we've evolved white by turning up the R3 repressor. So I want to now come back to that big picture about um, this, this filtering of uh, mutations at the, the sort of micro and macro evolutionary level and see if sort of uh, where we stand with this. So, so far, um, what contributes to segregating flower color polymorphisms within species? Um, I showed you this DFR case um, in Iochroma, a CHS case in Ipomoea. In other systems, people have also found um, R2, R2, R3 mid mutations causing flower color mutations within species, but fixed between species, we've only ever seen changes at two, um, two loci. So still this contrast isn't great, but I think it's consistent with the hypothesis that there are particular loci that are targeted and particular ways to make white flowers that are preferred, specifically down-regulating just the parts of this pathway that are involved in anthocyanin biosynthesis and not messing with those upstream parts of the pathway. So if we were to go back to that selective funnel, I picture that at some point in time all of these mutations arise in populations and that over time um, these R2, R3, these R3 and R2, R3 mutations that affect flower color are the ones that make it through the other side of the funnel and can contribute to species differences. So I do want to note that we're really missing a lot of mutations here. So, um, the spectrum of mutations, we really expect to encompass all of the genes in this pathway because these genes were originally found by people doing transposon tagging in Petunia. They were originally found by knocking them out and growing up those flowers and seeing that the flowers with the knockout gene are white. So they should be able to produce a viable flower that can produce, a viable plant that can produce a flower. So um, we haven't discovered them yet. One possibility is that people haven't looked very hard. And so um, that's part of this project, is just to look very hard and figure out what the spectrum of mutations is in natural populations that gives rise. And in Iochroma, as I've mentioned, we just have tons of flower color polymorphism to work with. So hopefully as good of a system as we could choose. However, I'm increasingly uh, reconciling with the possibility that some of these we may never find in the wild because what you can grow in the greenhouse may just not make it in the wild. It's possible that a CHI knockout, you can grow it in the greenhouse in Petunia, but if it happens in nature, that plant is not going to be um, hardy enough to make it to, to maturity and flower to be collected by me. So, so I think it's quite possible some of these mutations this pathway, we're just never gonna find. So um, with the last bit of time, I'd like to turn to talking about macroevolution, because I'm very interested in these sort of big picture patterns of trait evolution. And so um, I do think that we're getting to the point of saying, all right, we have really a pretty good sense now of what genes are contributing to species level transitions. Um, and we can start asking, so given uh, the mechanism by which this happens, um, what are the consequences of these transitions? So for example, do we see that lineages that gain or lose anthocyanin pigments, um, do those have different rates of speciation and extinction? Are those evolutionary dead ends once you lose your pigmentation? Um, and are these changes uh, reversible? So, so once you go to white, can you go back to blue? How easily can lineages transition between these two states? So, um, this is uh, some work that um, just, got, just came out in AJB that um, Emma, and, Emma Goldberg and I have been working on for a long time. So we put together um, 
a, a sort of a meta-analysis of a bunch of groups that look like iachroma but are bigger and so hopefully have more power to address these kind of questions, but that show the same pattern of gain and loss of floral anthocyanins. Um, so the first thing we found is that really there's no strong effect on diversification. So lineages that don't have floral anthocyanins don't go extinct more and they don't speciate less. Um, so these do not appear to be evolutionary dead ends, and I think this is directly related to the way that they probably got there. If they got there just by tinkering um, with these transcription factors and the expression of these genes just in flowers, there probably aren't pleiotropic consequences that would make them evolutionary dead ends. Um, Secondly, and consistent with this idea that um, that's these expression changes and not sort of uh, pathway degeneration that gives way to white flowers, um, you can go back. The gain rates are um, significantly higher than zero, and in many cases, they actually exceed the rate of losses. That gain rates are higher. It's, it's uh, more frequent that you gain anthocyanins than you lose them. Um, and you can see that, that here in these panels. And so given the fact that um, you have, that these changes are controlled by these class of rapidly evolving transcription factors that are also very specific and have lots of duplications in different groups, kind of allowing lineages to pop back and forth between having floral anthocyanins and not having them without tremendous consequences, I think that leaves um, these gains and losses to be largely driven by the, uh, the ecological situation and what selective forces are there. So, so this pattern um, may not reflect just uh, developmental constraint or just the, the way that these changes happen, but the kinds of selection pressure. So if gains are more often favored than losses, then this is exactly the pattern we would expect. So um, I think that flower color offers us a really tremendous example to start connecting the microevolution of traits to these big macroevolutionary patterns. I mean, we really want to know um, uh, what drives these patterns whereby lineages can pop back and forth between states? What determines how quickly they can do it? What determines the tempo of phenotypic evolution and its directionality? And, um, you know, a lot of that depends on the genetic architecture of these traits and the way that species transition happen. And so by looking at a trait with so much intraspecific polymorphism and fixed differences, we can start to really hone in on how phenotypic transition happen and to what degree the, the molecular basis for these transitions affects these very broad scale patterns where I'll note this is um, about 700 species of Solanaceae and you can see quite a lot of transitions back and forth between having anthocyanins and not having anthocyanins. So I think this is very consistent with this regulatory story for how anthocyanins come and go from flowers. So um, I'd like to close by, by thanking people in my lab. I've starred people that have specifically worked on this project. They're really good at jumping. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, people um, who've helped me in the field, some fantastic botanists. Marco Cueva is the person who discovered that new polymorphic species in the south of Peru, and Segundo has been a colleague of mine for a very long time. Um, as a postdoc, this work was funded by the NIH and currently is funded by the NSF. Oh, I also wanted to mention that um, I am recruiting graduate students at the University of Colorado, so if you um, know of people who are looking for graduate programs and are interested in studying the macroevolution of floral traits, um, I would really love to talk with those potential students. I'd also like to take a minute to um, just mention people that have mentored me. I only have time here to put up actually a small selection of tens, maybe even hundreds of people who've given me bits of advice or taken really substantial amounts of time to help me over the years and shape my research program, shape the way I think about science, and mostly just to encourage me to figure things out <laughs> that, uh, that, and be supportive in that process. So people all the way from my undergrad years, um, fantastic systematists, plant molecular biologists, people who don't work on plants at all but are just very supportive people, um, Barbara Pickersgill, who I worked with for my master's, who made me decide, oh yes, it's definitely Solanaceae, definitely. Um, uh, people, people at Q, who I also worked with at my master's, and, and Sandy at the NHM, and then of course my PhD advisor David and my postdoctoral um, advisor Mark Rauscher. And I think, you know, each of us sitting in this room probably has easily as many people that they could think of that have written them letters of recommendation, helped them work through manuscripts, just generally given them support during their careers, and we can't pay these people back. So I think all we can do is try to pay it forward to all the undergraduates that come to us and be supportive and encouraging and think about what we needed as an undergraduate or a beginning person and offer them that same kind of support. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you.